is what you're looking at is the current that's the scene at this moment at the World Trade Center. Stan Daler from ABC's Good Morning America is down uh, in, in the general vicinity. Dan, can you tell us what has just happened? Yes, Peter. It's, it's Don Daler down here. I'm four blocks north of the World Trade Center. The second building that was hit by the plane has just completely collapsed. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off. When you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it My pulled God. it down on itself and it is not there anymore. That should be it. it Thanks has very much. It completely collapsed. The whole side has collapsed? The whole there? building has collapsed. The I whole building, building has collapsed? The building has collapsed. That's the southern tower you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. The second building that we witnessed the airplane enter had been, the top half had been fully involved in flame. It just collapsed. There is panic on the streets. Thousands of people running up Church Street, which is what I'm looking out on, trying to get away. But the entire, at least as far as I can see, the top half of the building, at least half of it, I can't see below that, half of it just started with a gigantic rumble, folded in on itself, and collapsed in a huge plume of smoke and dust. We are talking about massive casualties here at the moment, and we have, whew. That is extraordinary. There is panic on the streets. There are people screaming and running from the site. The gigantic plume of smoke has reached me, and I'm probably a quarter of a mile north of there. Peter. Now, this is a... This is what it looked like moments ago. My God. The southern tower. 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning, just collapsing on itself. This is a place where thousands of people work. We have no idea what caused this. Um, if you wish to bring uh, anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. Peter? Yes, Dan. Uh what, what appeared to happen from my vantage point, the top part of the building was totally involved in fire, and there was it, there appeared to be no effort possible to put that fire out. It looked like the top part of the building was so weakened by the fire that it just the weight of it collapsed the rest of the building. That's what appeared to happen. I did not see anything happening at the base of the building. It all appeared to start at the top and then just collapse the rest of the building by the sheer weight of the top. There was no explosion or anything at the base part of it, but I, I did see that the top part of it started to, to collapse. The walls started to bulge out, bricks, glass things coming, coming out, and then it collapsed in on itself, and it appeared to just fold down from there, from the very top. Thanks, Don, very much. Um, just looking at that, I don't know why, but I'm, yeah. when was the last time the United States was attacked in this fashion? It was Pearl Harbor in 1941. Um, from the scene now, uh, there's obviously ma massive casualties. Uh, usually during these things, there's a, a little bit of a high pitch, but basic calm over the police radios among the emergency workers. Um, I can hear them screaming, uh, signal 1013, uh, which is the police code for help, uh, calling for help at the triage center, where other people who are already injured have been injured more, um, confirming that the the building has collapsed, uh, dozens of officers, more civilians are injured, and we don't know, although I'd have to suggest, given the size of that building, what progress the evacuation was in um, of the tower that uh, collapsed. Peter. Yes, uh, Pierre, Pierre Thomas. Uh, one thing I might add is that in recent years, the U.S. government has been preparing for massive attacks, but it's been primarily focused on biological, often, mm -hmm. often bombing attacks. One of the things I have not heard discussed at all in government circles is the notion that someone would hijack a plane and perhaps fly it into a building. So 
one of the questions that I'm sure that will come out of this, if this indeed is a terrorist attack, is what kind of defenses did the U.S. have in place to deal with an event like this? Well, we talked about that even, Pierre, just before you came and joined us, because at the Emergency Management Center, which is just literally in the same complex as the Trade Towers, uh, they talk at great length about their preparations for a biological, a chemical warfare attack, how they closed tunnel. I mean, they've been very efficient, taken them very seriously for many years. I'd be a little surprised if the notion of an airborne attack on a United States target had not been, had not been discussed. But the notion of the intelligence services knowing absolutely nothing of what is going on today and saying openly right away they had no warnings whatsoever uh, is, and you say something very important, if this is a terrorist attack, we just keep saying that in a repeated basis. Um, not, not having any notion whatsoever of what's going on is to be reminded not only of the efficiency of terrorism, but uh, just reminded of the efficiency of terrorism. At it's, this uh, point. it's ironic. There's a, there's a chilling story. Uh, Lou Shalero of the FBI, um, who was part of the capture of Ramzi Youssef, who was the mastermind of the World last Trade bombing Trade. of the World Trade Center, told me this story that he was flying over the World Trade Center in a helicopter with the suspect Ramzi Yosef next to him after he was captured in Pakistan. And as they passed over, Lou Shalero uh, nudged him and said to Ramzi Yosef, uh, you see, it's still standing. And Ramzi Yosef smiled and said to the FBI's assistant director, it wouldn't be if I'd had more money. Um, this was in other words more money to buy explosives more money to run a more efficient operation than the one he ran from New Jersey in 93 exactly and I mean we may have seen uh, the second coming of that plan uh, John McCreffy is on the phone at the Pentagon Hold it, let me just John McCreffy we've now heard reports that three planes have been hijacked today can you confirm that Jack McCreffy at the Pentagon Okay, then let me go quickly to someone named Don Wright, who saw the plane crash into the Pentagon. Don, are you there in Washington? Yes, I am. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, it was about 9.35, and I was looking out our 12th floor windows at 1600 Wilson Boulevard in uh, Roslyn, Virginia, and I watched this. It looked like a commuter plane, two engine, come down from the south, real low, uh, proceed right on and crashed right into the uh, Pentagon. Went directly into the Pentagon? Uh, that is correct. Looked like a deliberate act? A deliberate act, sir. And can you tell me what direction it came from, Don? It came, it came from the south. Came from the south, up along the river, across the land. It came. It came from the south. Okay. And do you, do, did you happen to look at your watch? To, we thought it was just a little bit before 10 o'clock. Well, I was watching ABC News, watching the uh, Twin Tower, uh, and about and about the time I saw the plane, I watched it come in very low over the trees, and it just dipped down, came down right over 395, right into the Pentagon. And are you fairly sure that it was what we sometimes describe and recognize as a yes, small I commuter plane? Uh, yes, it was. Good, Don. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. You're Don very Wright, welcome. an eyewitness to the crash at the Pentagon. Now, we have had, as I said, reports today. There are hundreds of reports flying around, and so we beg your indulgence on us saying as often as we do these are reports they're sometimes unconfirmed they're sometimes confirmed we'll try to make it absolutely clear what we absolutely know and what we're uncertain about there are now reports around of three aircraft having been hijacked today so we have at least because we've now had eyewitnesses to three de apparently deliberate uh, aerial assaults involving the aircraft themselves two on the trade towers in New York City and one on the Pentagon itself, just described by Don Wright as a small two-engine commuter plane which came up from the south. And we now believe that three planes were hijacked, two of them from Boston and one from somewhere else. We are not yet sure uh, precisely what's happened. Um, John, you're listening. Uh, just to uh, clarify for people, John, who's a who's uh, our, one of our leading reporters on crime, uh, knows New York City probably better than anybody in, in many news divisions. Uh, I cannot tell you where that happens. That's either a U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force or Navy aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, uh, now on patrol in what we've described as the no-fly zone uh, over New York City today, lest there be one more 
attempt. John, go ahead. Uh, they've continued evacuations in the area now. They've, they are evacuating Battery Park City, which is a large apartment complex uh, taking up many blocks across the street from the World Trade Center. And uh, they've evacuated the federal court buildings where the terrorism trials of Ramzi Youssef and others were held. Uh, anything that could be a symbolic target is now being emptied out in New York. New York is, is going into kind of a lockdown mode. I think you'll also see in Washington the same kind of air patrols have been uh, scrambled around uh, principal buildings there. Okay. We have on the phone one of those people who, who uh, makes his living analyzing terrorism. Um, Kyle Olson, do you hear me? Yes, I do. I, I, I wonder if on a day like this anybody wants to be thought of as an expert on terrorism. Um, be that as it may, and assuming that and knowing that much of the country is shocked at the uh, apparent breadth of this, are you? Well, you know, this is a, this is the the kind of attack that uh, that has fallen more into Tom Clancy novels than into uh, into actual response planning. Um, having said that, we've been anticipating for a long time. We've wondered why it's been so relatively quiet. Uh, the, act, the suggestions of Osama bin Laden's involvement. What has he been doing since coal? Uh, other other groups out there with uh, with a, a real or imagined grudge against the United States. Uh, the nature of the event is shocking. The uh, the fact that it's happened is not. Thank you very much, Kyle. Really appreciate it, Kyle Olson. Yeah, one, uh, one quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. One quick thing. The, accus the suggestions that are floating around out there right now, there's apparently this claim from the uh, from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Right. Um, very interesting to yes, know. If, if this is if this is legitimate, if this is, if this claim stands up, this appears to be okay. the first time this group has targeted Americans. This group has primarily steered away from the more extreme end of the of the violence scale. They focused less on suicide bombings more on uh, more on on gun attacks and and that sort of thing in the territories against Israelis well if, if it, this it holds it, up this is a different this is a very different tactic well it. if it is true and of course the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine was very much involved in attacking aircraft in the 1970s uh -huh. which carried Americans so certainly let's accept your notion that it's a recent attack on on Americans thank you Kyle very much you bet um, uh, as, as mr. Olson makes clear there has been at least one claim and those of us who cover this for a very long period of time are always suspicious of claims. Uh, people who cover international terrorism. I'm going to interrupt myself. Linda Douglas, our Capitol Hill correspondent, I think is on the phone. And if she's not, she already reports there has been an explosion of some kind at the Capitol. Is Linda Douglas on the telephone? Uh, let's get her on the phone as quickly as we have. She just reported a couple of minutes ago that the leaders of the Congress uh, Senator Lott, Senator Daschle, the Republican and Democratic leaders uh, in the Senate had been taken to some un or have been taken to some undisclosed secure location. Um, our general assumption is that there's no panic involved in this, that somebody in the Capitol building, as someone in the Washington, in the White House, has a book which says that when these things happen, here Thomas, maybe you can confirm this for me, when these, these things happen there are certain modalities which you behave and as you see the hierarchy of the American political establishment, the military establishment being attacked, you want to protect the chain of command. Absolutely. The first thing they try to do is get everyone in secure positions so they can gather information and um, make decisions about what to do next. Uh, one of the things that law enforcement officials had been planning for is the notion of a multi-tiered attack. Uh, an attack occurring in multiple places simultaneously because one of the things they've talked about is that terrorists want to project more fear as much fear as possible and one of the ways you can do it is to have this notion that attacks are happening on multiple fronts yeah well and, and there, we've never seen anything like this before in the united states of course and, and in fact not seen anything like this in my record i've been doing this for 30 some odd years i don't recall any multitude of attack we've had two or three we've had two suicide bombers within a in a short period of time in the Middle East. Uh, we had the two embassies uh, in Africa, uh, in Kenya and in Tanzania, the attack two summers ago in the United States. But the notion that uh, the terrorists, either an organization or organizations, plural, uh, should be able to mount a concerted effort against the United States in this way, causing in this instance so many casualties, in the, in the instance of the Trade Tower, certainly so many casualties, is, is going to astound people in the political and military and, and intelligence establishment. Absolutely. The notion that you could have multiple attacks like this, they had been planning for it, they had not seen it, 
Um, this is a extraordinary escalation, one that they were they were predicting would happen, but no one would think that it would happen this quickly. Okay, John Miller. I think. Uh, right, let me just interrupt. I sure. apologize again. We're now looking at a, a helicopter over the Pentagon. That makes perfect sense this morning, but given the fact that we're all sensitive to the presence of any aircraft, uh, that was a helicopter that just flew across the screen. That is. And as we had one, at least one eyewitness said this was an attack on the Pentagon from the south. He described it quite confidently as resembling a commuter aircraft, which is to say smaller than a small private aircraft and not as large as a commercial jet. It may have been a, a prop jet. Um, it may have been a jet, but it's a smaller version of the jets which so many people in so many middle-sized American cities are now accustomed to seeing. In terms of the realm of terrorism, this is going to be a real uh, first test, uh, literally by fire, for the Bush administration. You recall, after the embassy bombings in East Africa, uh, the Clinton administration uh, waited about 10 days and launched a missile attack against the camps of Osama bin Laden, who they felt confident at that time they could say was responsible for it and who's since been charged in it. Uh, in this case, I think this ratchets up. Uh, Excuse me. This is the Pentagon we're looking at now, according to my, uh, according to my monitor. And again, it is hard to, to grasp what part of the building we do not know if they're in the courtyard or outside, but you can see that a fairly considerable amount of damage has been done. We do not know whether these are offices or storage areas. The Pentagon is full of uh, many thousands of people uh, every day. The Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, has been saying only yesterday and today that he wants to reduce the, uh, the bloatedness, as he put it, uh, as he alluded to it in the military and the bureaucracy. But this is the great home of the, of the military bureaucratic establishment. Um, John, before I come back to you, uh, Dennis Cross is on the phone. Dennis, do you hear me? Dennis Cross, do you hear me? Yes, I can, Peter. Dennis, I understand that you were in the World Trade Center when either this or these attacks occurred. Am yeah, I correct? That, that's correct. It was, uh, I guess it was slightly before 9 o'clock, and uh, I work on the 36th floor in One World Trade Center. I work for in the insurance industry. Probably hundreds of people uh, in my industry uh, in both of these two buildings. And what was ha what happened? Um, as I was, uh... hey, Dennis, just let me stop for a second. Um, somebody is trying another telephone on this line. Could they please not do that while we listen to Mr. Cross? Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Cross. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, essentially, I was, uh, you know, sort of at my desk working, general office activity, and uh, felt an enormous. Uh, so I it almost felt like an earthquake. Like I could literally feel and see things in the office moving and the floor moving. Um, immediately after what it was some sort of explosion or something uh, there was an enormous volume of debris and paper it almost looked like a dirty parade uh, all of this material just falling down I, I was looking out the uh, south side of the uh, of one world trade and uh, everybody in the office was kind of screaming kind of gathering in the middle and I went to the window and uh, I immediately saw one woman uh, who appeared to be motionless uh, laying on the roof of the of uh, you know a lower building next to me. Um, at that point, everybody started to gather the things. They were trying to evacuate people down the stairwell. And what, did the light? Did the electricity go out in the building? Uh, the lights flicker, flickered a couple of times, and then it was weird. It was kind of like there was there was one uh, one sort of rush, and then shortly after that, there was another one. I don't know if it was maybe the other tower or if there were uh, elevators in the inside. I guess. Uh, you know, sort of just dropping to the floor. Are, are you aware that, that, that one of the Twin Trade Towers has now collapsed on itself? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about uh, probably five blocks from there on the corner of Greenwich and Warren. And, and as, we, as we looked at it on the screen here, Dennis, we could see uh, the smoke from this collapse just sweep the billow forward through the lower blocks of Manhattan. Did you have a sense of that? Completely. I was, uh, at that point, I'm, I'm a little bit northwest, it, certainly north, maybe to the west side of... Uh, uh, Tower One, and I was trying to get to Broadway. Uh, my wife works on the other side of downtown here, uh, and I'm still trying to get there. But the smoke, I literally, I couldn't see. It was a wall of smoke, and if you were in it, you couldn't see. If you were out of it, you could just see the wall of smoke. It was, how how never difficult? Seen anything. I'm sorry for interrupting. How difficult was the evacuation? Not there. It's I'm how, sorry, say that again, Peter? How difficult was, was it to evacuate the building from at least from the 30... It was 110 stories in the building. It, I would say that it wasn't 
it wasn't extremely difficult. It was just uh, slow going down a somewhat narrow stairwell. With light, if there with was any sort of, uh, you know, people who weren't able to move quickly, then it, it literally slowed down or stopped everybody. Um, I was on 36, so it wasn't too terrible when I got down to, you know, uh, the 15th or 12th floor or so. Uh, there was water coming in from the doors, you know, kind of at our feet level. Uh, and then it just was a waterfall down all of the, continually down all of the stairs, probably, you know, in some cases three, four inches deep at that point. Sirens and alarms are going off. Uh, and then people started to get a little frantic there. Dennis, thank you very much. Okay, sure. I really appreciate you calling in. You're Dennis very Krause, who, uh, who works, uh, on, or did work on the, on the 36th floor of the World Trade Center uh, in this particular tower, which is still standing. There's only one of the trade towers now standing, the other having collapsed on itself um, uh, not long ago. All of the federal office buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All federal buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All aircraft in the skies over the United States have been ordered to land at the nearest airport. Uh, all aircraft on the ground intending to go anywhere have been ordered not to take off uh, because the country, this is the Pentagon, because we've just seen a moment ago that at least one portion of one side or building at the Pentagon itself uh, has actually uh, collapsed. <clears throat> and as we warned you, the whole business of responsibility, claiming of and naming responsibility would be complicated. And now we've, uh, from, from the Middle East, a senior official from the, from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine has denied any uh, involvement, any connection to a double plane crash on the World Trade Center. It was, in fact, earlier on an anonymous caller who had called Abu Dhabi Television <clears throat> to say that the, uh, the DFLP was responsible. So for today, we'll put uh, aside as best we can the uh, trying to understand who did it, just knowing uh, somebody who did it. Now, uh, one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center was, uh, as, we, as we said some while ago, American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, Boston to Los Angeles. Uh, that has now been confirmed by the airline itself, um, or at least by their spokesperson, Lori Bassani. Um, it was a Boeing 767. It would, under normal circumstances, if it were full, carry about 160 passengers including two pilots, nine or ten crew, but we have no idea yet whether or not the plane was heavily loaded or not. Peter, a uh, big concern now from the scene that the Northwest mm -hmm. Tower, the one remaining standing, is, is leaning low. and uh, buckling in the, uh, in the Northwest corner. Um, they're moving back the mobilization areas and they're cordoning off the area in a much wider zone now because obviously they're, they are now concerned about the possibility mm -hmm. of a second collapse. I'm still desperately confused, John, about what may have caused the building to, to collapse. Um, As you watch <clears throat> the videotape, it appeared to buckle from the middle, from the point of impact and, um, and collapse, which, uh, not, you know, with no background in architecture, I don't know about the structural vulnerability, but as you, as you see, debris just starts to, to peel fall, away. then it cracks, and then it just goes straight down. And now uh, they say that the, the other tower is leaning. Um, if you look at some of the pictures, it appears to be on a slight angle uh, to the right. Yeah, they, uh, they say the fire is also spreading downward now through the tower. And I, I think there's a real decision to make there. I have not been able to, to hear whether they're keeping people in there to fight that fire or they're just leaving it empty to let the fire burn itself out because they're going to have a real problem with people in there if it's in jeopardy. At the same time, uh, New York firefighters have a reputation of staying until the very end. And if there are civilians in that building which need to be rescued, and clearly there are, then there's no way the emergency services, I can imagine, are going to, to uh, pull out at this point. Tom, and if the elevators are disabled uh, from that height, there's no fast way out. Precisely. 110 stories uh, down, and this appears to have occurred, this did, this, this occurred about two-thirds of the way up. ABC's John McQuethy now confirms for us, we've had from an eyewitness, or he adds to our eyewitness, uh, saying uh, that a small plane heading north, which is exactly what our eyewitness um, a little earlier uh, told us, uh, exploded at the base of the Pentagon, at the base of one wing of the Pentagon. They evacuated everyone inside, and there was 
uh, subsequent concern, which may have led to the FAA decision to ground everything, uh, that there was concern that another plane uh, might be inbound uh, towards the Pentagon. And by grounding everything, of course, by ordering everything to be grounded on all radio channels to all aircraft that are flying in the area, it puts the military, uh, Pierre Thomas confirmed for me, it puts the military in a position to take aggressive action, uh, as the White House did when, that, when, that, uh, when other aircraft have come close in the past. Absolutely, absolutely. What it allows them to do is to get a better sense of incoming. If you're ordering everything down, you're essentially clearing the sky so the Pentagon can see what's coming in. Another question that they have to look at here is whether any of these planes might have been laced with explosives to cause the additional collateral damage once the impact occurred. Yeah, these, these in every instance, well, I shouldn't say in every instance, certainly in the instance of the Pentagon, it looks more than a single aircraft just exploding on the ground. But again, we don't know precisely the size of the aircraft. Um, we won't speculate on that. But Lisa Stark, who covers aviation for us, confirms that it was American Flight 11 to Los Angeles. There were 90 passengers and crew on board. Um, and there was a second plane. Help me understand this not. So we believe that the two aircraft have flown into the trade towers. Both belonged to American Airlines. And they had both been hijacked, and there were 90 passengers and crew on the first plane and 60 passengers and crew on the second plane. That is the, if there's any doubt about that, someone please contradict me, but that is the report I am getting from our people who cover the Federal Aviation Administration and air travel in general, that there were two aircraft hijacked for this attack on the twin trade towers, now the single trade tower in New York City, and on the first, they were both flights to the west coast from Boston. And the first one had 90 people and a crew on board. And the second had 60 passengers and crew on board. I beg your pardon. The second plane was not hijacked from Boston, but from American, from Dulles Airport, we're being told, which of course is outside Washington. And we do not know if that was the let me just, I'm going to make this absolutely clear because this reporting gets muggy. We've, we, we've now reports of two planes from American Airlines, one from Boston, Flight 11 to Los Angeles, which we believe is one of the aircraft that went to the Trade Towers. We have a second plane, American Airlines Dulles to Los Angeles with 60 passengers and crew, and that is certainly bigger than a small commuter aircraft, so it may also have been involved in the airline. We'll do our best to, uh, to hand that down as well. Um, Senior law enforcement officials in Washington now tell us that a car bomb has exploded outside the State Department. That's a, uh, it's a report uh, now from uh, the Associated Press, uh, about to confirm it with our own people at the State Department, though everybody in Washington has been evacuated from their buildings. Um, but a car bomb has now exploded outside the State Department. And John Miller, I see you writing quite frantically on something else. It's uh, at the scene now at the World Trade Center because of the concerns of the structural stability of the remaining tower, a temporary headquarters mobilization point triage center was set up at Stuyvesant High School, which is about uh, uh, two and a half blocks up and slightly across the street. Um, now, the, uh, now the concern is that if the building falls, if the second building falls, that it will be falling in that direction. So they are now evacuating their own command post and triage center and they have to find an even further zone to move that to. Something that is striking about this today is that this is indicative of, with a car bomb at the State Department, a plane crash into the Pentagon. Two planes designated to crash into each tower of the World Trade Center, bringing one down. It, it connotes the, the level of planning and sophistication and um, extreme logistical ability that, that, that probably makes this singularly uh, the largest, most well-coordinated act of terrorism, uh, not just in U.S. history, but probably Certainly in, modern in, times. in modern times. Yeah, and, Unprecedented. And, 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 it's and, gonna be... and every time you say that, I'm going to go immediately to Washington, but every time you say that, I keep thinking of how we are told time and time and time again by the Pentagon and by the State Department that they know something's going Stand on by, in the uh, world today. They seem to have the north problem at the North Tower, uh, Peter. Let's look at the North, north Tower, Tower quickly, seems quickly. To be coming down. Oh, my God. The second, the second tower.
It's hard to put it into words, and maybe one doesn't need to. Both trade towers, where thousands of people work, on this day, Tuesday, have now been attacked and destroyed with thousands of people either in them or in the immediate area adjacent to them. This is, there is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes in people all over the world, friends of the United States and enemies of the United States as well. John Miller, very briefly, you said to us just a few minutes ago that this was their concern, that they thought after the first tower went that the second one was vulnerable. There was uh, constant intelligence that uh, terrorist organizations and uh, specifically that financed by Osama bin Laden was trying to mount another series of attacks against the United States. Of course, they thought of the symbolic t targets. The most symbolic was the World Trade Center because it had been attacked yet not brought down. And um, it seems that those concerns that even caused the World Trade Center to hire a senior FBI counterterrorism official just weeks ago to try and beef up security um, have come home to roost. It's also interesting to say that there is no type of security. Which would have prevented against this today. Well, Nothing. that's that may not, that's, I was gonna say that may not be able to be true because security operates in waves and concentric circles out around the world. Now we've lost the picture from there, so now we have it again. Um, well, wh wherever you are in the United States or in the world today, you can, the landscape of New York City has just been changed. And one has to assume that thousands of lives have been extinguished. And it may be presumptuous to say thousands, but thousands of people work in these buildings, and it, and we, and, and given the difficulties of evacuating these buildings, where, as we've said several times, the operate the elevators may not have been operating, and we're not operating in at least one tower, tower number two, the first one, which is to go. Um, that is the second attack on the southern tower, the first higher on this end of the tower, but both those towers have now, have now, have now gone. And here's what, here's a, here's a picture that doesn't exist anymore because that's not a live picture anymore. The, uh, It just now, can I ask where this picture is from? Do we know where this is? This this is uh, this is this know? is outside the World Trade Center. The sign uh, indicates the approach to the, uh, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. Bridge. To the Brooklyn Bridge. So we're. So we're, so we're on West Street, approximately uh, just north of VC Street there. And you can see the dust and debris. And this is at, I don't know if this is at an early stage or whether this is, is right now. It's at an early stage because there in the distance you can see the, at least one of the towers still standing as people wander many of them dazed and look at the cell phones in their ears this is in a cell phone society and it's certainly true in the Middle East people on their cell phones all the time seeking and offering reassurance to their families and their friends that something has happened in Israel and, and at least those with have them in the Palestinian territories these days there's constant traffic on the on the cell phones because 
There is such tension in the region and such tension here today, which is extraordinary, that people wanting everywhere to reassure or find out about what has happened to those who are near and dear to them. L uh, let one me... thing we should update for people listening, particularly in this area, who may have been worried, uh, there was a concern that if this building... You mean in the New York City area? Yes. There was a concern if this building fell that it would land on uh, the center they had set up at Stuyvesant High School where the, the students were still there. The reports from Stuyvesant High School now are that uh, everybody there is okay. Stuyvesant High School, the high school in the adjacent area which the, the city and the state authorities set up uh, to deal with the casualties that they could get out of the building or had occurred uh, adjacent to the building. It is just clear that a lot of people, we do not know how many, uh, got out of the building. And it is going to take time. It is going to take time. The New York City Office of Emergency Management um, which monitors the city and all its vulnerable points said when this whole thing began this morning they could not get an immediate handle on, on precisely uh, what was happening. And it was only... You've seen this before. This is a, this is a recording of of precisely what happened when the second tower went down. And this is from a very long distance. This camera is located on the edge of the Hudson River on, on, on the west side drive up the western side of Manhattan. And I cannot say this is something that people never believed they would see in the United States because, of course, Oklahoma City was when we all had that reaction when Americans experienced terrorism in the heartland for the first time, believing in many cases that it all happened somewhere else. Um, but I, but, but I just think that millions of Americans will be stunned by the magnitude of this today. Um, I'm trying to track down John McQuethy, our correspondent at the Pentagon. He was evacuated. I'm saying this as much to our control room as anybody. Um, he, like everybody else, was evacuated. I'd also like to talk, if I may, to Claire Shipman at the at the White House um, to see what the progression is there and Linda Douglas at Capitol Hill uh, because we do know that the leadership of the Senate at least Senator Lott and Senator Daschle were moved to a secure location uh, while much of this was going on but it is very difficult to get through on anybody's cell phone and this is Pierre Thomas another reminder of you wonder if this is something that people anticipate we now live in the age of cell phone we now rely on cell phones for so much when there's chaos like this too many people on the cell phones they don't work well, one of the things that they had to deal with today, Attorney General Ashcroft was in route to uh, Milwaukee today. And now with the planes grounded, he's going to have to communicate by phone. Uh, they have an uh, internal communication system at the Justice Department that they use in situations like this, video monitors. But again, everyone is dispersed. And with the planes grounded, this created a scenario that they, had, quite frankly, hadn't seen before. It is the grounding of the planes which pretty much brings to a halt. I mean, one assumes that Air Force One, with the president, is already on its way back to Florida. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. ABC's John McQuethy is on a cell phone at the moment, and while he cannot hear me, somebody can tell him to start talking, please, and we'll listen. Okay, we'll try that again. Anytime John McCrethy <coughs> begins to talk and tell us what's happening at the Pentagon or as much as he knows what's happening at the Pentagon, we will simply uh, let him go. But uh, it's just very difficult to get through on cell phones. Thousands of people trying to find out where their, where their friends and their relatives are. Thousands of, of uh, reporters, uh, uh, news organizations, of city organizations, state organizations, federal organizations trying to understand um, not only what happened today, which in some respects is secondary, but to get something done. Um, and, and there's just so much agitation around. You get a report just a couple of moments ago from, from the security at the Capitol Police saying that they believe a hijacked plane <coughs> may be bound for the Capitol. Um, it's, it's, it, there's an intensity in the air um, and a fear and a trauma in the air at... Uh, at 20 minutes to 11 Eastern time in the United States, 20 minutes to 8 on the West Coast, or in the Western part of the United States, the day has just getting beginning, and all of this has happened in um, under just under an hour. 
The first attack on the Trade Tower was uh, just before 10 o'clock. The second one came at, at three minutes after 10. We have a strike on the Pentagon, which came uh, a little after that. And the country is just riddled. Nine o'clock. Nine, nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, I'm sorry. Uh, the country's just um, overrun as it's inevitable it would be with, with, with rumors. I, I'm curious, John, in terms of the, of the emergency operation that you monitor, uh, are, are they in a sense of panic are they in a, or just in a sense of chaos? Uh, in a sense of chaos, uh, there was a, a brief sense of panic, which is understandable, when the first tower collapsed. By the time the second tower collapsed, they were prepared for it. Uh, there were numerous other injuries. The level of coordination is incredible. The FDR Drive, which is a main artery, has been shut down for the purpose of um, keeping it clear for ambulances to go to uh, hospitals. Uh, they've anticipated that the lower, Manha lower Manhattan hospitals in New York City will fill up, so they have started to uh, arrange uh, helicopter flights to go to hospitals further out in the circle. Um, they've, really been, they've really been pretty well coordinated throughout this. If you can possibly be coordinated uh, during a series of spontaneous events that amount to disaster, this is war, and, and war by uh, and by another definition. One of the we ironic... did manage to get we did manage to get Rebecca Cooper, one of our reporters, on the phone from the White House. That's how difficult it is uh, at the moment to communicate. Rebecca, do you hear me? Rebecca Cooper at the White House, do you hear me? All right, the same case with Rebecca says with John McCarthy at the Pentagon. If we do hear from them, we'll simply interrupt and let them, uh, let them uh, get Hello? on talking. Yeah, Rebecca, do you hear me? Yes, Peter, I hear you. I'm in the basement of 815 Connecticut Avenue. It's a building across uh, the block from the White House, across the park. It's, you know where that is, next to the Chamber of Commerce. I had to come down here because, as you said, none of the cell phones are working. I'm in the engineer's office, and they've given us our, their phones to use. There's a real dichotomy here at the White House, Peter. Tourists who still are not fully aware of what's happening across the nation are standing there watching with curiosity. They keep getting moved back. But those of us who are inside the White House realize the severity of the situation. I was inside the White House this morning trying to gather information for you when we were told by a very nervous uh, White House security staff that they feared a plane was headed to the White House. And we heard planes indeed overhead. And they quickly evacuated all of us out of the White House. Now, I just got off the phone with my own uh, crying mother who was very worried about where I was. And I will tell other mothers and fathers of people who work at the White House and reporters who work at the White House that most of the White House has been evacuated. In fact, in the building where I am now, uh, people have cordoned up other offices to try and coordinate the federal response to this. There are actually phone calls being placed to the legal counsel of the FAA from this building because they don't have cell phone connections. They are out of their offices. They are doing a good job of coordinating the federal response from here, but they are having to take all kinds of emergency measures to coordinate this response. But even uh, the White House chef, who just days ago was preparing a lovely state dinner for President Fox of Mexico, I saw him and I tried to speak to him. And frankly, Peter, he was too rattled. He said he couldn't speak and uh, he was with his staff and they were all very anxious and very worried because, of course, they did know what's going on in the country today. Many thanks, Rebecca Cooper. And if you just see that picture that was going by as Rebecca was talking, you get a real sense of what the urgency was in the White House. First of all, the, you know, the White House police came walking out and then people began to run out of the White House. Um, in and of itself, astonishingly uh, astonishing, because we we live with the notion that if there is any place in the United States which is which is fiercely protected, including um, an anti-aircraft battery, at least one on the roof of the White House itself, this is the place where the president and the vice president, of course, are to be secure. Claire Shipman is on the phone from the White House. Claire, we are now looking at. At, at what appear to be fairly relaxed uh, uh, security officers on the roof of the White House, uh, looking at the in the distance as they always do, talking occasionally to each other. There doesn't seem to be a high level of tension there. What's it like on the ground? Well, there's considerable tension on the ground, Peter. We are actually looking at a similar picture because we're across the street from the White House now in the Hay Adams Hotel. Um, the entire area around the White House has been completely evacuated. It's very quiet. The police seem tense. They're carrying automatic weapons. Um, we've also seen a couple of what appear to be fighter jets overhead. Uh, everybody in this area has been sent home from all major government offices. It's all a reverse commute. The highways we're told are just jammed. As you know, President Bush is on his way back to the White House. They've checked 
his plane considerably before um, sending him on his way. But as you mentioned, these guys on top of the White House roof are almost always here. And ever since that incident a few years ago, when a plane actually landed on the White House lawn, they've upped security measures so that they wouldn't have any other aircraft nearby. Uh, and that may be why they seem a little more relaxed than other areas around town. As you know, the AP has been reporting that um, there was a car bomb that went off at the State Department. And uh, a lot of people are talking about that. Uh, and, and there's also been some report that there were bomb threats on Capitol Hill, but we're still trying to find out more about that, Peter. Th thanks very much, Claire. There are indeed reports from the Federal Aviation Administration uh, that, that there are possibly one or two more planes that have been hijacked this morning and are still missing. When you think of the number of aircraft that crisscross the United States, not to mention fly overseas every day, uh, this is the Pentagon. This is the Pentagon. This is live coverage from the Pentagon now, which gives you some sense of the force with which this aircraft, described to us as a, as a small commuter-sized aircraft, uh, flew into a side of the Pentagon um, coming from the south this morning. And again, we, uh, the communications in the country are so, uh, are so difficult at the moment. And as you've heard from beginning to hear from everybody, the cell phone network uh, is choked uh, for a variety of reasons, that it's hard to get a handle at this point on on um, uh, casualties at the Pentagon or the extent of damage. The one place on which it is, in which we can be focused because it is such a small place, Manhattan, 11 miles long, uh, um, is the Twin Trade Towers. And, and by some remote chance, if you've just joined us on television, the Twin Trade Towers in New York City have been destroyed with hundreds, presumably, or perhaps thousands of people in them. Each of the two towers was struck today, attacked today uh, by an aircraft, one of which at least we know was hijacked. And this is the second tower that went just uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, a scene of chaos and devastation uh, in, in, lower, in, in the lower part of New York City, right on the edge of the Hudson River. Everybody in the United States is familiar with the Twin Trade Towers. And, and, and we have no idea what, uh, whether there were tourists there who sh show up every morning to go and stand on the top of the Trade Towers because it is one of the most expansive views uh, southwest and north of the city and the area itself. Bill Blakemore is down there. Bill, do you hear me? I do, Peter. Go ahead. I'm just north of Canal Street, just a, uh, just a few blocks north of the Trade Tower area. Throngs of people have been, of course, moving north, some of them silent, most of them looking stunned, just saying we're just trying to get out of the area after both towers have collapsed. We're seeing Delta Wing jet fighters circling overhead uh, just one at a time. When the first one appeared, the group of people amid which I was standing uh, shrieked and said, oh my God, there's another attack. And then they realized uh, that being a Delta Wing jet fighter, uh, it was probably the U.S. military, which of course it seems to be. There's just a couple of helicopters, apparently police helicopters circling overhead. And on this very clear morning now, the, the unusual sight is the lack of the trade towers sticking up above the buildings that are normally here. People have now begun to accept, but just barely begun to accept what's happened. All business at a complete standstill, nothing but sirens down here as these throngs move further and further north, just walking away from what they can barely begin to understand. Peter? And, and Bill, how far north did the, did this, I mean, we looked at some streets which debris had just gone in a huge wide area. Right. I seem to be just north of where that hit. Um, I'm just up at Canal, so... Uh, there seem to have been enough low-lying buildings that is no more than, say, 20 or 30 stories high between us and the base of the tower to have protected people here from the debris. Uh, but here's another man walking past me, just, just looking completely dazed, going north, uh, two or three other women. The crowds are beginning to thin out now, as most of the people uh, who were just standing around and watching were working there. One woman came up just talking a mile a minute with her daughter and her friend and her daughter describing how they had gone to their school this morning uh, she was about to go to the trade tower uh, to pick up something from a shop there when her daughter said i want a sandwich mommy and so she stayed back she said otherwise i would have been there they're still trying to understand uh, how they're so lucky not to have been over there uh, there must be thousands of such stories here this morning peter of those that were the lucky ones 
Thank you, Bill. Please stay in touch as often as you can. It's now 10 minutes to 11 Eastern time, 10 minutes to, to uh, East in, uh, two minutes to eight in, in the West. Uh, and I'm just gonna add to the chaos and the trauma of the day by saying that a large plane has now crashed uh, just north, or sometimes I say just, but crashed about 10 o'clock in the last 50 minutes, north of Somerset County Airport, uh, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Um, this is, uh, this is um, reporting from one of the Pittsburgh television stations uh, as a result of a 911 call from the airport itself. There are no other details on this crash yet. Um, and it's not clear whether the crash was related to anything else that has happened in the country today. Uh, but the plane, which was believed to be a Boeing 767, uh, crashed about 8, 10 a.m., uh, just about eight miles uh, east of Jennerston, Pennsylvania. Uh, people in the area will undoubtedly be reporting in more clearly to us on that. Um, the New York mayor's race is having a primary today. Now that has now been canceled, uh, both on the Republican and the Democratic uh, side. Uh, there was a, uh, a um, I apologize for interruption. Somebody's trying to say something. Go ahead, please. Okay, just stand by just for one second while I just finish. I'm just repeating, the New York Merrily primary has uh, been canceled to the, uh, today and um, as we said, there's reaction coming in from, uh, from the Middle East, including a claim of responsibility, then a denied responsibility. Now a message from the Palestinian president, Yasser Arafat, condemning the aircraft attacks on the World Trade Center and, and sending the condolences of the Palestinian people um, to those who have been victimized by it. Um, outside the Pentagon, another member of our ABC News staff, Chris Dreer. Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Peter. So would you uh, tell us what you can see? Yes, Peter, I'm standing at the fringe of Arlington Cemetery watching the Pentagon as the top of it caves in. There's a lot of black smoke, a lot of twisted debris. The Pentagon itself has caved in from the top. There is much fire uh, coming out of the windows. Uh, it looks like uh, something from World War II, Peter. Um, Chris, uh, can you tell me, it's a little hard to tell on television, how much of the building has collapsed? How wide is it? How deep this is it? Do you have a sense of that? Yes, I do, Peter. The center portion of the Pentagon appears to be breached. That is, apparently there's a courtyard, and the of that is completely caved in from where I am, from where I see it. Okay, I think you're on a cell phone, Chris, but just confirm for me that a portion of the building has been breached and the aircraft appears to have pushed its way through into the courtyard? Yes, indeed it has. I believe, Peter, that that's where the plane is, but I am not sure at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, is there any evidence, uh, is there any movement around there at the moment? We're looking at a fairly static picture. Are the people arriving, people disappearing, yes, ambulances so coming? Time, Peter, there's a great deal of glass and wind fire coming out of, the, uh, out of the windows, but on the other side of the Pentagon is where most of the uh, emergency vehicles are now. I'm going to try and get around to that side to see what I can see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I should tell you that all military personnel in the, in the District of Columbia area now, all military personnel in the district, are now on something that is called Threat Level Delta, which is the highest state of alert in the military, and all other people, all other military personnel in the country are now on alert status Charlie, which, uh, John Miller, we know is a, is a somewhat lower status of alert, but still a reminder uh, that, the, that this, this disaster has spread like wildfire through all of the political and military establishment. Good morning, I'm Bob Mueller in the News 2 Newsroom. We want to keep you updated on this national emergency. Terrorist attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C., the military now on alert. Here in Nashville, things are happening. We want to keep you abreast of the Nashville International Airport is shut down, no flights leaving. The only flights coming in are flights that are close to the airport. The FAA has ordered all planes out of the sky and told them to land at the nearest airport. At least a dozen planes have landed at the Nashville International Airport. Whether they were intended to come here or not, they are now on the ground. News 2's Chris Bungard is live at the Nashville International Airport to tell us more about what's going on out there. Chris? Well, Bob, obviously this stunning national tragedy has touched the Nashville Airport, as you mentioned. 
Right now, nothing is going out of here. Planes are coming in, planes that were in the air. And there are still a few of them that are coming in, including some from Washington, also some from New York. Now, if you take a look at MassCam here, you can see many of the planes, some of the planes that are out on the runway area here. You can see that there were a couple of planes. So you're also actually we're looking at tape here from about uh, an hour ago just to stun people watching this thing unfold first watching one plane go into the world trade center then another and of course many of them were learning about the tragedy as they came off planes they were in the air when this happened we talked to several or a couple of these passengers and got their reaction and i just flew in from michigan and well, she just called to make sure I made it here safe because of what's happening right now. So I'm hearing it for the first time. Did they tell you on the plane what was going on? Mm, just as soon as we came here, I've seen everybody standing at the TV. And that's it. And, uh, everybody's just like staring amazed, just like watching, them, like confused what happened. So I just now find out it was like New York and Washington. Now we are looking at some of the planes out here at the Metro National Davidson County Airport here. Some of them still moving. We're looking at our mobile city cam shot. Once again, planes are not leaving here. We're told that the airport officials are in a meeting right now planning what to do with the rest of the day. Of course, they're hearing from the Federal Aviation Administration. Planes that were in the air are landing. There's a few of them that are still coming in. They probably will be dribbling in throughout the morning here, but obviously, uh, you know, all the thousands of passengers here learning this news are stunned. It's a very, a lot of the uh, security personnel obviously are in on a high alert. It's, it's a day that, uh, of course, everyone will remember the rest of their lives as this tragedy unfolds in Washington and New York and perhaps other places as the day goes on. Chris, we've been told by airport authorities that at least 5 o'clock today, probably not until tomorrow, will any of these planes leave the airport again. Uh, have the folks in the terminal been told go get hotels. Do you see an increase in security watching over those planes that are parked on the tarmac? Well, I think, uh, you know, we'll take your questions one by one here. Inside, uh, all the uh, airlines have people. We see a lot of folks running around from the airlines, literally running inside the tarmac or inside the uh, terminal here, trying to help folks who have questions, trying to answer people's queries as they come off the plane and they're going, what happened? Where am I going to go? How am I going to get here? There are some, uh, there I did over here one conversation with uh, I think a Southwest Airlines employee trying to find hotels for people. And it's probably gonna be at least until tomorrow as we talked to one airport official said that before anything goes out of here. And again, there are planes that are coming in. As far as increased security, I'm sure that's going on behind the scenes, but that's not, not something we're gonna find out about right now. We of course normally can, when we do these kind of shots from the airport, uh, you know, during Christmas and Thanksgiving and the typical stories that we do out here, normally we're up in the terminal. We've been asked to move, uh, we're about a thousand feet away from the terminal, probably about 500 feet away from one of these, uh, uh, from the tarmac back behind me here. Chris, let me interrupt you just a minute. The yes, Tennessee right. Emergency Management Agency is now telling us that the state of Tennessee, not surprisingly uh, in regards to the incidents today, has been put on high alert. What that means is that it's increased security, most likely at federal buildings, at the state capitol. Uh, we're trying to contact the governor. We are told he is at the capitol, and uh, he will more than likely have something to say about what is going on statewide, whether businesses, state offices will be shut down, whether federal offices will be shut down. The military, we are told, has been put on high alert. We are uh, having a crew at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to find out what that means there. Although, as Chris said, uh, when this happens, obviously their first duty is to get in position to do what they are told to do. So it may be a while before we find out exactly what that means for the state of Tennessee. Chris, can you see, are there more planes in the sky still trying to get down, or is it pretty clear out there now? Well, let me take a look behind us here. We, we saw when we first got out here about 9 o'clock, we saw at least two planes, three planes land. We saw, of course, we talked to some of those passengers. We're also looking at mobile city cams, some of the planes that are on the ground here. Some of them probably were already parked out away from the uh, from the gates, but there we believe there's been a few that are just sitting there or, or planes that were supposed to be going to other other airports that are now been pulled away. It's uh, you know, this is just an unprecedented day in American history that everyone is going to remember for a long time. People now are out here at the airport are calling loved ones 
They're calling, you know, back to work. Everybody's checking on cell phones, saying, you know, I think everybody at the studio and also uh, that we've run into is, uh, has called home or had calls from loved ones, that sort of thing. That's what's going on out here as it is probably all over the country right now, Bob. Uh, thanks, Chris. As we said, the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency has said that the state of Tennessee, uh, like probably most states around this country, is on a state of high alert. We will update you throughout the morning as we get more information regarding what's happening here in Nashville and Tennessee statewide. We can tell you that the, uh, the governor is probably going to make a comment of some kind later on today. The military up in Fort Campbell has been alerted. Uh, we are probably going to be some kind of security measures taken at TVA nuclear plants, at federal buildings, those kinds of things. As we get more information locally, we will bring it back to you. We want to keep you up to date, obviously, on the national coverage of this horrible tragedy, the terrorist attacks in Washington and New York. We return now to ABC News. Are able to exploit conventional materials uh, in a very devastating way. What McVeigh did at Oklahoma City in 1995, uh, using commercially available materials uh, to some devastating effect, although they weren't the casualties that we see today. But uh, 1993, uh, the... Uh, hey, but Vince, let me, Vince, let me yeah, interrupt sure. you for a second, and, and I apologize. I sound no, like fine. on the attack here, but um, there is a, there's a feeling in the, you notice I haven't called anybody a terrorism expert this morning. I don't think anyone wants to be known as a Thank terrorism expert Thank you very much. And because, because, but we have a series of terrorism experts who appear in our lives and sound, and sometimes sound off knowledgeably. I exclude you from this, by the way, otherwise I wouldn't raise it in your presence. And sound off, you know, knowledgeably about uh, how we know this group and that group and that group. And this is, among other things, a desperate failure of intelligence uh, in both the human and technical area. Am I right? There's no, there's no question about it, Peter. It's a, it's a major intelligence failure. The inability mm -hmm. to anticipate this kind of uh, a terrorism event on U.S. soil. I, I think that uh, they were focused on bin Laden in Afghanistan. They were focused on U.S. facilities abroad. And I don't think they believed that bin Laden or a consortium of groups collaborated.